Hey everyone, the name is Eric Dorn. In today's video, we're talking about why sensors can be more intelligent and intuitive. Okay, so there is a common idea that intuition is synonymous with intelligence and that the capacity for intuitive thinking is a sign or a hallmark of being intelligent. And certainly people that have the capacity for advanced intuitive reasoning should by every metric consider themselves to be intelligent. It is certainly a mark of intelligence to be capable of deeper intuitive reasoning just as it's a sign of intelligence to be able to phrase your thoughts in a simple and straightforward manner focusing on application and learning how to break down your thoughts and complexity into something that you can work with on a day-to-day -day basis. And now Typically, the intuitive personality types can have this kind of false mindset, which is that, well, we are the smart ones, right? And you are the stupid ones because you speak simply, because you focus on application, because you want ideas to have a use or a specific purpose. You might just not be that intelligent, right? And now let's talk about why sensors are more intelligent than what we might think. Okay, so you might have heard the idea that sensing personnel types are more inclined to athletic pursuits and sports. And certainly there are quite a few sensors that enjoy sports and have and engage in some kind of sport or athletic activity. But certainly not all sensing types engage in these kinds of activities. And certainly there are many different ways to be a sensor and to engage in sensory activities. And on top of that, certainly we can speak of intuitive personnel types that are very physical and that engage in sports and that even do really well in physical activities, right? Which means that we can't, when we look at an athlete or a soccer player, outright assume that they must be a sensing personality type. We'll have to sit down with them and have a conversation and learn about their thoughts and priorities. Furthermore, when we go into Eastern philosophy and martial arts, we learn that a lot of the time the mind and the body and intuition and the physical act can be connected. And in fact, much of Chinese philosophy and Taoist practice goes into this kind of pursuit of being able to unite mind and body. And so, when you engage in these kinds of martial arts, you learn that there's a lot of intuition and thought and reflection that goes into these kinds of activities, making sports and athletics an introspective and thoughtful and contemplative pursuit. On top of that, we can see that many of these gifted martial artists were also gifted philosophers and thinkers capable of bringing out the complexity of life in their own way and in fascinating ways worth studying and thinking more about and having deeper and longer discussions about. So what's really going on? How is it possible that sensing and intuition can be bridged in such a manner? And how is it possible that intuitives can sometimes be like sensors? And why is it possible that sensors can engage in and show and manifest a deeper and higher level of intuition? Well, the first thing we'll have to do is we'll have to get rid of this way of thinking about things as dichotomies. We like to believe that the world can be arranged into these kinds of different sides and coins, right? And we like to believe that if a person is very intelligent, they're probably not going to be very athletic, just as they're probably not going to be very empathetic. And if a person is very physical and very athletic, we must assume that, well, they can't be very intelligent. They must have very poor grades in school and they must be doing really well intellectually, or rather really badly. But when we start going into it, when we start looking at the numbers, we find out that typically kids that are really well and really talented in school tend to also have really good grades, showing that people that engage in sports and athletics are actually more likely to demonstrate higher level academic skills and intellectual capacities. And so our very premise seems to be wrong. We can't score people on a dichotomy and assume that, well, people that are more on this side must be less on that side. We have to assume that people can be on both scales at the same time and that in fact these two scales are more connected than what we thought. In fact, much of the body is distributed and organized by the mind. It requires a high level of cognitive control to be able to engage in and demonstrate finer motor skills, to be able to hold and conduct your move your body and to discipline your body you require a lot of fortitude, mental exercise and effort. And so what is to say that this kind of effort, this kind of exercise cannot be manifested into intellectual domains as well? 
In fact, the brain is more than capable of learning to do and engage in two forms of thinking at the same time. When we look at and we start looking at neuroscience, we start finding that, well, yes, certainly we can see that certain parts of the brain seem certainly more responsible for certain activities, right? So, okay, I have some, for some reason I really like the word certain today. But the point is, yes, neuroscientists can find that different areas do different things, but they can also find exceptions. They can find people that have learned to use an area typically associated with language for mathematical activities. While typically you tend to assume that mathematics is in another part of the brain, right? And here is where the conundrum arrives, right? Because the brain is a very, very complex organ. It's about 750 megabytes of raw data, but it's packed so efficiently that this data is and often engaged in cross-contextual use, meaning that one cell can be responsible for a certain, maybe, <laughs> not certainly, maybe, uh, a specific memory, right? A specific situation, or it might be involved in a specific task or a specific activity but it can also be involved in multiple activities and multiple tasks. There are neurons that are highly specialized, but there are also neurons that show this kind of polymath-like behavior, which means that, yeah, they can do multiple things at once. Meaning, yeah, um, you can have English and Spanish stored and used in by similar neurons, but it's this, this distinct pairing between different neurons firing at the same time and in a certain way that produces these kinds of uh, complex thoughts. So true, 850 megabytes of data or trillions and trillions of neurons and synapses all working in different areas can produce completely different mental states, experiences, activities, thoughts, and so on and so forth. And these things are more aligned than what we might typically assume. And so when we talk about sensing and intuitive types, we might have to consider a fourth scale. We might have to consider it as a four-point scale rather than a two-point scale. We might have to assume that uh, a person can be strong in both sensory activities and intuitive activities at the same time. And that just because a person is really good at sensory activities does not mean that they will always be very good at intuitive activities. There is, however, a kind of law which might be what gave rise to this very stereotype and this notion. And that is, it seems from a neuroscience point of view that it's very hard to engage in two forms of thinking at the same time. And that means typically when a person is engaged with an athletic activity, all of their neurons and all of their brain power goes into that activity, at least when they are pushed to their limits, right? So when you are on a sensory level pushed to your very limits to in a sensory engaging task, you're probably not going to be able to at the same time engage in an intuitive task at the same level. So you can say that these networks are anti-correlated. When a network is anti-correlated, what it means is they can't be used exactly at the same time. And so you have to switch back and forth between them. But this does not say anything about the potential capacity you have for each of these two. Meaning that yes, you can't engage in sensing and intuition at the very same time. Most likely what happens is you switch between the two or you learn to coordinate and break into the left and right halves of the brain to coordinate somehow differently, doing one task with the left and one with the right, right? Because that's kind of distinction is possible. Most of the time, however, it's not possible, which means that yes, you have to switch between the two and you have to engage in different forms of thinking at the same time. But that also becomes an important lesson for you because you might see a person, you might see them do and engage in a physical task, and you might see them be and engage in sensory activities. And you might say that, hey, this person seems to speak very simply, seems to be very straightforward, seems to be focused on very application, seems to be very short term in how they think about things. But that does not mean that they have not previously spent a lot of time thinking about this from an intuitive point of view. That doesn't mean that they haven't spent a lot of time breaking down and thinking about this from a more complex angle. A person can be very quick, very shallow, and very stereotypical in how they express something in the situation while having spent a lot of time thinking about it behind the scenes, right? I similarly, I tend to get criticism from people that say, oh, Eric Thor, he doesn't know the cognitive functions. He doesn't know about, you know, uh, Carl Jung's original theories. He's only talking about the dichotomies. But here people make the misunderstanding that just because I didn't mention it in that specific video at that specific time doesn't mean that I don't know that theory. I haven't studied it, haven't looked at it for a very long time, haven't read it extensively, right? It's simply a choice of 
when to speak about something and how and what and in what way, right? Because when we're speaking about something, if we can't phrase it like a beginner, we don't really truly understand it, right? Because an intuitive thought, while it sounds thought-provoking, complex, and often perplexing, does not mean anything if we can't think of a practical interpretation of that intuitive thought. Similarly, when we engage in practical forms of behavior and focus on the here and now, if we don't take the time to reflect on that, we might miss perspective on what we're doing and why we do it. And so we might end up engaging in stupid behaviors that don't really generate the results that we want for a longer perspective and for the future. So this is uh, how I look at intuitive sensory divide. Thank you so much for watching and see you all in the next video.